Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic, real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. First off, thank you for the, I don't even know how many I stopped counting, who of you who have wished me a happy birthday. And don't forget Julie's birthday. Yes, her birthday is the 12th and mine is the 9th, is on Monday. So if you guys want to inundate her <laughs> with happy birthday wishes, I'm sure she'd appreciate that as well. But I do appreciate okay. all of them. It's impossible for me to thank all of you guys personally. So hopefully I'm covering my bases on the podcast. Julie, welcome to today's show. Thank you and happy birthday. Yeah, it's about time you said happy birthday, my God, woman. <laughs> uh huh. Again, no, it's okay. I just enjoy okay. the fact that you are indeed a year and three days older than me for three days instead of just. Hey, years. that's right. I'm now officially with a, a younger, younger woman. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Opposed to just a younger woman, yeah. Opposed to just a year younger than me, now I'm with a year and three days younger. Hey, that's probably not Every okay for me counts. to be talking like this. Yes, it does. So listen, guys, we are going to be on. talking about. Moving on. <laughs> um, so uh, we love your emails. And when you get your emails, most of the times they're just short and to the point. You know, those are great. And we all usually um, respond um, the same day we get them. If they're long, drawn out, you know, very detailed, analytical type emails, well, those can take a long time just because they take longer to read, let alone respond to. But I got a really great email from uh, uh, Debbie Constigl. Constiglio, I believe, that Julie's going to read to all of you. Um, this email was cool because it really does encompass a lot of the other emails that we get. We get a lot of agents emailing us asking for direction, a lot of email agents emailing us asking us, you know, basically trying to feel us out if we're a good fit for them to be a coach and those types of questions. But hers got to the heart of what a lot of agents need to be considering when it comes time for them either, either to hire or fire a coach. Um, it's, I like doing shows like this because it cuts through all the bullshit. You know, a lot of you guys don't have a clue about what it takes to go about hiring a coach. Really, I mean, honestly, you guys, most of you don't even ask any pre-qualifying questions before you hire a coach, and so you end up having these sort of weird experiences with coaching, thinking, "Well, I guess this is what coaching is," and then you come across Julie and I, and you realize, "Well, that wasn't what coaching was supposed to be." Uh, so before we get started, I'm going to give you guys a, um, a website we created a few years ago that was designed to help kind of help you cut through the Mickey Mouse out there about people who are calling themselves coaches. Look, anyone can call themselves a coach. There's no rule or law against it. You know, it is what it is. Um, but really, if you're, I assume you take your business seriously. I assume you take the money that you're paying this coach seriously. So I think you should take seriously the job of hiring the right coach for you. So we created a website called comparacoach.com, comparacoach.com. Just go there, check it out, read the questions. And if anyone is soliciting you to be your coach, and I don't care if it's your in-office person, I don't care if it's your, I don't, doesn't matter who it is. I want you to really, really uh, put them through the grinder and make sure that they're qualified to be your coach. Um, and we're going to be talking about that a lot on today's show. That is today's show um, and uh, inspired by Debbie. So Julie, unless you have something else, if you just want to read yeah. Debbie's email, go for it. No, it's good. I thought it was great too. Okay. So she writes, hello, Tim and Julie. I have been listening to your podcast for almost a year. Thank you, not only for the content, but for your delivery. I have been a realtor for nearly 20 years. At one point during the recession, I was so burned out that I was considering going back to school and saying goodbye to real estate forever. During that time, I revamped how I conduct my business. While applying systems, I took on a relational approach versus a transactional approach and slowly built a wonderful referral business. I absolutely love my clients and my business. Over the last year, I have found that I have hit a ceiling in my business. I, now, I know a lot of it has to do with the need to add on an assistant. I also feel I have not been filling my pipeline with new potential clients. I have been so busy working in my business, taking care of my current clients, that I have neglected to work on my, work on my business. Okay, important words here. 
I am at a fork in the road. I have been in coaching for a few years now, but I feel I may have outgrown my current coach or simply need to go in a different direction. I will need to make a decision soon on how I want to move forward. I just wanted to thank each of you because listening to your podcast regularly, my mind has become open to additional directions that may better suit me and my, the growth of my business. Thank you from Debbie. Okay, so I asked her for her permission to read the email, and she said that was cool. And then I asked her who her coach was because her coach wasn't us, and it was a coaching company I've never heard of before. Um, so I won't even say the name of the coaching company, but, you know, here's what Debbie is experiencing, and I'm just going to kind of cut through it. She's done a good job of defining her first spoke. And a lot of you guys, and so spokes in the wheel, let's just make this conversation very basic, and then we'll kind of expand from there. In your notes, in your mind, if you're driving, running, whatever, just do this obviously in your head. I want you to think of an old, an old fashioned bicycle wheel and a bicycle wheel that has many little spokes, not like these modern carbon fiber racing wheels, you know, that you see on bikes, but I'm talking about the, you know, the old fashioned spoky wheels. Now in your mind, draw a big circle and then draw a little hub in the middle of the wheel and then draw your first spoke. That first spoke, we always suggest, well, it, depending on your situation, right? But nine times out of 10, we're going to suggest that first spoke is your center of influence and past client spoke. Why? Because it's easiest to do business with them. There's virtually no resistance. And going after your centers of influence and past clients is, you know, it's not real selling. It's just basically, essentially, it's relationship building. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not being critical of it. Huge advocates of it. I just told you nine times out of 10, we suggest that agents have that as their first spoke. Okay. Here's where the problem happens. That can't be your only spoke because what you're going to experience and what Debbie experiences is in the end of basically what you're going to get out of that spoke. You will experience, uh, you'll level off the amount of business you'll be able to get from those particular people. And you can expand that spoke until the cows come home. But the reality of it is, is you will plateau and you'll need to add more spokes to your business. Now, here's the other thing that happens sometimes. What if you have to move? I mean, seriously, what if you'd move? What if your husband, your wife, what if just whatever happens? What if happens to your community? We've had agents, coaching clients whose communities have been basically, you know, Big Bear, caught on fire, couldn't sell there anymore for a while, or where they're just in different places. Maybe they, I've had coaching clients personally who had to move from one part of the country to the other because they developed adult allergies to something in there. You guys get the idea? So if all of a sudden you have to move from one community to the other, maybe an extreme example, but you guys get the point, and your only source of business is your centers of influence and past clients, you're out of business. Follow me? So your goal should be, and we're going to expand on this, your goal should be to have at least seven spokes, and each of these spokes are designed um, to provide a steady source of business. Now, some of them will be doing more than others, but your center of influence and past client spoke, Debbie, cannot be your only spoke. Otherwise, you'll experience, Debbie, what you're experiencing, which is you'll quickly plateau. Happens to everybody who builds their business based on centers of influence and past clients at some point. Now, why is it this, again, why is it so many people advocate that and talk about it? Because it's easy. There's nothing to it. You just basically romance your centers of influence and past clients through various means. You can gift them. You can write letters to them. You can throw parties for them. You can do all these types of things. And it's fun, easy, really low stress, low impact way of lead generating. Um, and if many agents will essentially, uh, depending on the price range, obviously, and their commission, will exceed, maybe meet their goals, just centers of influence and past clients. So we have a lot of people that join our coaching program, and that's what they want to focus on. And if they are blessed with a high average sale price, and you know, they can probably carve out a good living and they don't care if they plateau at a couple hundred thousand dollars in personal income per year. They're happy with that. That's fine. That checks all the boxes. They're happy. They don't need to be earning gazillions of dollars a year to exceed their, you know, whatever. Now, if you're in an area where the average sale price is lower, then you might be dealing with a different situation or you're in an area where you don't have a well-established center of influence and past client list. Maybe you just moved there you're not born there. You're not from there. You're not real social. Maybe you're an introvert. It's going to take you so long to try to build a reliable source of business as you know, center of influence, past client as you spoke, you're going to go broke. So you have to have multiple spokes. Conceptually, I think everyone will agree. Now, here's where Julie and I came across this epiphany. This was, so we'd always personally in our own real estate practice, oh, did you guys listen? A coach that sold real estate. We're going to talk about that in a second. So Julie and I always had multiple spokes because we knew what we we're saying intuitively, though we couldn't necessarily articulate, but we couldn't say it like I just did. Um, we weren't coaches then. We knew that it was important to have multiple spokes, multiple sources of income. But this was really driven home. It's probably been about, I don't even know how many years, 15 years ago. I received a call from a gal 
who was a fantastic agent, one of these top, maybe we knew her from Howard, I don't remember where, but we had been talking about creating new sources of business for ourselves. And our sources of business always focused primarily on the ones that were um, proactive, not passive. In other words, we weren't huge, though we did eventually add passive folks. In other words, we did do paid lead generation eventually, uh, in form of you know postcards and things like that. All of our course folks were ones that uh, were uh, generated by us actually proactively going after the business because that's obviously the most pro, uh, profitable business. Um, and then after those spokes were uh, created, then we added the spokes that may have been more passive. For example, we had a geographic farm. We did things like that. And I, so when Julie and I say, for example, geographic farming will get you this, it's not just because we're just, you know, bullshitting you. It's because we experienced it and we had a lot of the coaching clients to experience the same thing. You know, geographic farms now are basically coming back into vogue, but you guys don't realize that sometimes those things don't work like ever. And if there's multiple agents that are farming in the same area with postcards and whatnot, you're wasting your money. You just are. There's so much that goes into whether or not a geographic farm is going to work or not. It's not just simply a fact, a function of sending out pretty cards. And you ever notice that the people that are trying to get you to buy off on that, those ideas will also basically predicate it by saying, now you got to be ready to get no response for six or 12 months. And then maybe you'll get a listing. I mean, you ever thought about the futility and the stupidity of wasting money on something? Oh, no, hold on now. You're making an investment in your business because those people will think of you first. That's your goal is get them to think of you first. Bullshit. Because there's other agents doing the same thing. If you guys think you're going to get into the end zone by having those be your primary spoke, you're not. Now, after you have other spokes, when you can afford to do other things, then let's have those conversations. But don't, get, don't build your wheel with the weakest spokes first. Cause, and that is, again, what a lot of you do. Because it's a path of least resistance. You don't have to put yourself in a position where you're proactively regenerating. I get it. It's the wimp's way out. That's the truth. Julie, anything you want to say as I have some more coffee? <laughs> well, yes. So I think you're absolutely right about that. We're not saying that that particular spoke, past client center of influence, and constantly talking to them, touching them, having coffee with them, brunch, lunch, postcards, and all the rest isn't good. It is part of what we teach you to do in Premier Coaching. It is a fantastic foundational spoke. However, to your point, it takes longer than you think. It takes more expenditure than you think. And if for any reason you have to move, or even if you don't move and your market hits the fan and those people stop moving for fun, and you are what we call in our Harris Rules book, a one-spoke wonder, then your business hits the wall. And you know, a lot of people come to us in coaching because they either plateau, as Debbie was mentioning, you know, you're only going to get so much out of that one spoke or because that spoke goes away for different reasons. I would add to this, Tim, it's not just that one spoke. It can be other things. I had a coaching client that had a really sweet deal worked out with what she thought was a sweet deal. Uh, her broker had a relationship with USAA relocation, and she used to crank, you know, 15 to 20 buyer relos, not the lifestyle we necessarily recommend, okay? But the broker lost that relationship. No more spoke for her. It's all she knew how to do. She came to us to learn to be a listing agent. Okay, so it's any one spoke that you want to be very careful about. If that's the only thing, and especially if you, know, if you have a coach and that's the only thing that they're teaching you to do because they know you're already good at it, what value are you really getting? But well, don't, 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 don't jump ahead, Jules. Don't jump ahead. Don't jump ahead. So I know you, Julie and I wrote down 10 things to know if you need to hire a fire coach. Julie wants to get to her notes because we got some salacious stuff. All right, so just to finish the wheel on the now, the wheel spoke idea. So I had this call yeah. with this gal. Her, her main, her main uh, source of uh, business was over the phone prospecting. So she would, a phenomenal prospector. Fizbo's expired, you get the idea. She got laryngitis. And as all good over the phone prospectors, uh, you know, will do when the doctor told her to take some time off and not talk, she ignored him. <laughs> ignored him, ignored him, ignored him. And then she loses her voice. And she's like literally... I mean, could have done permanent damage to herself because all she knew how, to, knew how to do, her only spoke was over the phone prospecting. Calls us after her laryngitis clears up, basically had, you know, a personal coming to Jesus you know, with regards to essentially the fact that she was a one spoker, had heard us presenting this and then said, I need to build more spokes. And then she went back and retooled her business and her business went to the next level because then she had multiple sources of income. So that's what you guys need to be thinking about. If you have a one spoke wonder, if you are a one spoke wonder, you are going to leave yourself very susceptible to the pebble in the road. The wheel it, it, with one spoke, getting back and closing in on the uh, analogy here, the bicycle wheel going down the wheel road, if it only had one spoke, 
if that little, if that wheel hits a pebble in the road, that one spoke does not have enough structural integrity to keep the wheel strong. So the wheel is going to collapse. You guys get it? When that wheel collapses, your business collapses. You see how this all ties together? That's the reason you have a minimum of seven spokes. It could be five spokes. If you've got really five kick-ass spokes, that's great. Look, if you're in Hollywood, for example, if you're one of our big roller agents out in the West Coast, you could have spokes as business managers. You could have spokes as a, a business networking group. You could have a spoke as you know that type of thing. You guys need to define what your own spokes are. Not everyone's are the same. Some people have, um, you know, maybe you're from a small town in Texas and maybe you grew up where you're living. And so you have a spoke from the PTA. You maybe have another spoke that's going to be from the communities you grew up from that you, we define, help you define as coaches, what your spoke should be. And then what we do is we intentionally help you build the spokes in the order that makes the most sense. And the makes the most sense are the ones that are going to give you the most benefit, the fastest, the cost you the least amount of money, if anything at all. That way you make, are you listening everyone? Do you guys get our approach to this? We take a business approach to helping you guys make money. So Debbie says, again, I'm at a fork in the road. I've been coaching for a few years, but I feel I've outgrown my current coach or just simply need to go in a different direction. You obviously have. And Debbie, now Julie and I are going to get into the meat and potatoes what we wrote specifically for you um, with regards to basically how to know if it's time to hire or fire a coach. So we're going to go through these. Julie, I haven't seen her notes and she hasn't. I actually, she has seen mine. Um, but let's just move through this. So how do you know if it's time yep. to hire or fire a coach, Julie? Well, how do you know? If I would say, look at Debbie's uh, email, for example. Point. When you feel like Point. you have hit a wall, okay, how do you know when it's time to hire or fire a coach? Well, for example, uh, not moving forward in net income. You keep on, and we hear this all the time, whatever that number is, maybe it's 50 grand a year, maybe it's 300, maybe it's a half million a year, but you keep on doing it all the time three years in a row, haven't had any change or movement. And I would say worse than that is that you're falling backwards. You're not even recreating the wheel every year. Um, all they let, do let is- Let me tail in on that. Yeah. Well, yes. let, so you just said something, it's really important. Julie just said something. And you guys were, we just literally prepared this about 15 minutes ago. So if we stumble over each other, it's probably because she and I have the same exact notes. Um, so number two, I would say to what Julie's point is, it's not, it, 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 but yes, making more money every year, but look, I'll go as far as to say is increasing your revenue every year doesn't really matter as much as increasing your net income. If you basically earn 300000 every year and you net, say, 250000 275000 that's not so sucky in your marketplace where like Debbie's from in Michigan. Maybe you're doing pretty good there. Maybe you can basically, you know, check all the boxes that you have for yourself financially. You can spoil your family. You can do what you want to do with your life. It's all unique to your individual situation. There is no one size fits all in coaching, which is another, you know, we're going to get to that in a, in a second. But yes, I want you guys to know what, whether your net income is increasing. Next to that, um, I will, if, you're, if your net worth is not increasing. Now, some of you don't know how to do your net worth. The easy button on that one is just go to mint.com and put all your financial stuff into mint.com and it'll tell you what your net worth is. If you're not in, in, intentionally, obviously, clearly increasing your net income every year and you're not in, increasing your net worth every year, why the hell are you in business? I mean, ultimately, the litmus test of whether or not you're successful in a business, from a business perspective, guys, from a financial business perspective, because that is what we are, we're business coaches here, right? It's whether or not you are actually making a profit. And with that profit, can you invest that money into things that will produce income for you passively? And we love, obviously, and many of you do as well, um, residential real estate, paid off res residential real estate, income producing properties, cash flow properties. So with that in mind, are your, is your, is your, yes, maybe your gross revenue is increasing. Yay! But is your net income uh, your bottom line, is that increasing? If not, I'd say you're making a mistake. Just increasing your revenue just for the sake of being able to, you know, earn more awards and have more people kiss your ass at the local whatever, you know, realtor awards banquet and all those types of things. But your actual net income isn't increasing. Why are you doing it? It could even be going down. Uh, you know, maybe you're building a big team and you're spending a lot more money and your gross is more. But because you're doing all of that for the sake of just getting the awards and having a bigger team and all this and a bigger office at your office, your net can actually shrink even though your gross is going up. So somebody needs to be keeping an eye on that and getting in front of it. And if you don't have a coach that's doing that, then they're doing a disservice for you. It's something we get kind of upset about anyway. So, so the um, next point that, yeah. 
the next point that Julie and I both wrote down is, is your coach trying to befriend you to be a cheerleader? Are your calls all about, rah, rah, go Debbie, yay? Is that all mindset bullshit? Is it somebody trying to be a, you know, guru? Are they talking about your feelings and your emotions and your goal boards and your blah, 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 blah. Is that what your coaching call is? Really? How do you really feel? That doesn't. That is what I would call a classic waste of money in your time. Guys, listen, yeah. at the end of the day, those types of calls are easy for a coach. They're just, you know, basically boilerplate calls. They read some Tony Robbins book, and now they're all motivated to basically act like many Tony Robbins. That's what a lot of people do. Or they become John Maxwell certified coaches, and then you're going to be talking about mindset for a half hour a week for the rest of your life. Look, mindset and all that stuff has its place. It does, but really for the most part, when you're focusing on your mindset, you're just hiding from the real work. And the real work is being of service to other people and learning to master the art, really, the art and science, if you will, of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. So is your coach just a cheerleader making you feel good every week, helping you with your mindset? Or are you actually having conversations that make you uncomfortable? Which brings us, I think Julie and I wrote down a series of similar questions. The next question would be, is your coach truly challenging in you? And how would you know? How would you know if your coach is truly challenging you? Are they asking, are they having conversations? Are you sometimes ending coaching calls a little bit pissed off with your coach? Are you sometimes ending coaching calls sometimes a little bit angry, a little bit disappointed? Are you, are you, are you experiencing signs, sometimes confusing emotions about your coach? That's a coach that's probably trying to challenge you. That's a coach that's probably trying to force you to go to the next level. That's a coach. That's a good one. That's probably a coach that's, that's okay making you uncomfortable because that's where your growth is going to be. Wherever you're resisting in your business and by the way, in your life, that's where your growth is going to be. Your biggest bang for your buck in your life is going to come from you writing down all the things that you do not want to do. And then you basically decide to say, I'm going to learn how to not just do them, but I'm going to kick those things ass. Whatever those things are in your business and personal life, that's what a coach is supposed to help you focus on. You guys understand the difference? A good coach knows how to ask questions that cause confrontation between you and the coach, but between you and your own probably outdated dogma, how you think, how you act. Julie, anything you want to tag on that? Well, so in other words, what you're saying is a great coach, it, it's more important for them to move you forward than to be your friend. That's right. And that causes them to challenge you and to perhaps have you be uncomfortable on the call at times because they find out what it is you're resisting because that's what persists and that's where you need to have the growth. So I would say just to highlight that a little bit, Tim, that a great coach actually detects those weaknesses. Lazy yes, coaching is just the mindset stuff. Lazy coaching is just, you know, some, some coaching clients, we know this. I was just talking to one of our coaches about this. Sometimes you guys will come to the call and all a coach would have to say is, okay, start talking. And you guys just go on and on and on about whatever your agenda is. And that may or may not be the most important thing. A great coach gets your train back on the tracks and is like a heat-seeking missile with whatever is the flaw that needs to be corrected to get you unstuck, to take you to that next level, and doesn't just be complacent and let you do whatever you're going to do on the call or just be your friend or just do a mindset seminar. They actually are actively working on your business, not passively working on your business. The passive Let's give them an example. is way easier for a coach. <laughs> Let's give me, so, so here, I'll give That's you guys a typical true. example. I'll give, you a, I'll give you an example. So Julie and I will get an email from one of you. And the email, we get a lot of emails from agents that, like Debbie, who have been in the business for decades. And uh, Debbie's going to have a call with Julie or myself. And she's going to choose. I gave her a choice. <laughs> So she knows what she's getting if she asks for me or asks for Julie. So here's the thing. When you uh, are on a call and you come and a lot of, again, a lot of people that specifically seek out Julie or I to coach them, they're looking for ultimate accountability. They're like Debbie. They're saying, listen, I've been up this mountain, down this mountain. I've tried this. I've tried the other thing. I'm not actually significantly changing my situation, my business or my personal life. Or really, I'm not moving the ball financially. That's really at the heart of it. But sometimes you get these people that basically say they want to be coached and they'll come to the coaching call, you know, I'll give them 15 or 20 minutes and they'll then talk about themselves constantly and talk about all the rewards and their plaques and all, all how great they are. Normally this is men, if I'm being honest, women very rarely act like this. You know, men, generally speaking, are going to, they're, they're calling to have a coaching call with me 
because they want me to tell them how great they are. That's the reason they have me on the phone. That's the truth. They want me to tell them how great they are. I won't do it. Now, if they're going to be good at something, I'm going to tell them. But here's where 99% of the time, they're actually, their ego is trying like hell to prevent me from basically confronting them about what they really need help with. But something inside of them decided to put themselves, their head in the lion's mouth and ask for help and be on the call with Julia or myself. So I always ask this question. And I want you guys to ask this question as well. Are you where you want to be or thought you'd be financially after all the money and all the deals you've done in your career? Because I'm speaking to the folks that generally speaking want to be coached by Julia or I personally. Do you have the net worth? Do you have the financial security? Seriously, do you? Do you have the paid off rental properties? Do you have the passive cash flow? Do you have the money in the bank? I know many of you don't. Why? Why don't you? Because no one's ever confronted you about it. That's why. Because people have placated you your entire adult life. That's why. Because when you sold 100 houses for a first year, the first year, people lose sunshine up your ass. And then you want more of that sunshine. So you stop focusing on what mattered most, which was producing profit through being of service to other people and uh, doing what you didn't want to do when you didn't want to do it at the highest level. You started selling your financial future. Your ego basically started selling it. So I'll ask the question. So tell me, you know, Mr. Big Shot. All these houses you've sold, you're the trillion dollar club, you know, people have tattoos of you on their butts and all the whole thing. You know, you guys know the types. What's your net worth? How many paid off rental properties do you have? If you couldn't work for six months, what would happen to you financially, let alone 90 days? Very rarely, I would say in the, I don't even know how many, I've had maybe 10 people in my entire career who were able to say, I'm squared away, bro. I got my money. I got my, you know, I paid off rental properties. I got my stuff. And when those people are on the phone with me, what they're wanting is they're wanting to go to the next level even beyond that, or they're wanting to basically figure out how they can level off and just level off their passive cash flow. But it is fascinating to me in our industry, how our industry celebrates the wrong thing. As an individual practitioner, as a small business owner, your focus, obviously taking care of your clients, selling listings, all the rest of it, but your main focus must be on your net profit, and increasing your net worth. And so often we find you guys have had, you know, this coach, that coach, you've been to this seminar, that seminar, you've done this, you've done the other thing, but you have nothing to show for it. You have been in this business. Some of you know us from back in the 90s. We may have met at a Howard Brinton conference when Julie and I were Howard Brinton stars. And you, you basically are coming to us and you're saying, listen, I, you know, knew you guys 25 years ago and financially my situation is still exactly the same. Why is that true? Because nobody confronts you because nobody tells you the truth. I, you know what? It's because you haven't sought it out. Something probably, and if you're not ready for this message, I get it, but something probably inside of you that's making you want to be on a call with Julie Rice specifically, or maybe it's just in our normal premier coaching program, something inside of you says is enough is enough. Something inside of you says, you know what? I want something better for me in my life and my family and my loved ones. And I want to be able to leave a legacy of showing my family members at the very least that they can do what they wanted, you know, what they set their minds to. You know how people say that, but how many actually people do it? You know what I mean? So as you go through the question of asking yourself whether or not you need to fire your coach or hire, a co hire your coach, I'd say the real first question is, are you truly ready? Some of you aren't. Look, Premier Coaching is a great place, is a great place for you to go and get familiarized with coaching. But when you move up the ranks into our, our Premier Plus, Premier VIP, or certainly Elite Coaching with Julia or I, you better really be ready for the, to be coached because you're going to be challenged. We're, this is not by a friend. We're not by a friend. And when some of our coaches, and Julie and I listen to our coaches' calls, when we hear their coaching meander into the by a friend realm, trust me, we take corrective measures. Your coach cannot be your friend. They can be your coach. They cannot be your friend. And some of you guys are incredible manipulators. You have coaches now who you've been able to weave in and out, string around, control the conversation, get them to not hold you accountable to Jack. You basically have become the you know, dominator of your coaching call. And you're, you know what? You're, you're, just pay, you're paying for a friend. That's insane. It's crazy. Why are you doing it? Julie, any thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I always use this example. I, I can sniff this out so fast because many of you guys know I'm uh, you know, a musician. I took years and years and years of private lessons. So on the weeks that I didn't practice, not that that ever happened, but let's just say it did. <laughs> okay, so on the, week that, on the weeks that I didn't practice or didn't practice either what I should have or hard enough, in other words, I was not being accountable, the easiest way to get out of that 
was not to reschedule my lesson because that would just get you in further in deeper because that's admitting that you didn't do anything okay but it was to show up and like ask my teacher about their dog or about you know something specific that I knew they could talk about for about 15 minutes that would get me off the hook now that was a waste of my whatever I was paying for that lesson absolutely and it was me being slimy about accountability and my the best teachers that I ever had in music would never let that fly. They'd be like, all right, that's great, but let's crank out a C minor scale. Raja, for example, my piano teacher is always hardest. Okay, would not put up with that for a second. That's how I know. Now, our coaches know from different life scenarios that they've had as well, and they know that we're onto them. You're not, it's not that we don't want to be friendly with you. It's that our job is to move the needle. It's to move you forward. And I have to say, Tim, as we wrap up this call, for those of you that are in other coaching programs, and you're not moving forward, just because somebody's a coach does not automatically make them know how to move you forward. If they've not sold real estate at a level that you want to or higher, they might just not know what to do with you on the phone. And that's, well, that's too bad, Julie, but it's correct. Just hover there. But just hover there. That's really at the heart of it. That's where these guys go wrong. They don't pre-qualify who they're going to basically have to be their coach. That's the reason we make compare a coach. But guys, look, has your coach sold real estate before? There are major coaching organizations who have coaches who literally have never sold real estate before. They're just reading scripts. In other words, you join that coaching organization, you're going to learn centers of influence and past clients. You're going to follow their specific agenda. It's going to happen in the same order that it does for everybody else. That's not coaching, guys. You guys are some of you are spending six, ten thousand dollars a year on that. That's not coaching. Others of you are basically joining coaching organizations where they have an agenda. You join the coaching organization like the emails we read yesterday, and all they want to do is pressure you into buying leads or buying the CRM or doing this or the other thing. They are trying to get you to conform to the thing that they are getting paid commissions on to get you involved in. Yes, you heard what I just said. They have agendas. They're not personal. It's not a personalized approach. But when you find a coach that has uh, basically further up the ladder than you, and it's done in, in a way that you are in alignment with somebody who has basically been financially successful. And I'll even go as far as to say it's been familially successful because there's a lot of character issues. If someone's, you know, been divorced a million times, obviously, you know, there's things you need to really take into consideration as to whether or not you want this person to be in your head because you're going to be paying them a lot of money to essentially give you direction in your business and personal life. And those things always bleed because you're small business owners. There's not going to be a clear defining endpoint for, you know, it, oftentimes what happens in business has a direct effect when it's a small business on your personal life too, right? Time allocation, things of that nature. So you really have to be very critical. Now, I know what a lot of you guys have suffered from. I joined ABC Corporation and they assigned me to this particular coach. And they said that was that. Really? You thought that was okay. So you continued to pay your $600, $800, $1,000, $1,200 a month, and you weren't able to actually pre-qualify that coach. You don't know whether they sold real estate. You don't know whether they sold real estate at a high level. You don't know what their actual skill set is. You thought about that, how stupid that is? Would you hire a doctor that way? Would you hire anybody that way? You wouldn't, would you? And yet, the most important thing in your professional life, hiring someone to actually give you direction. Now, I'm going to even, I'm going to go as far as to say, the reason that uh, brokers and office managers usually make terrible coaches isn't because they don't have the aptitude for it, but because they're in conflict with telling you what you don't want to hear. And I totally understand because Julie and I have been involved in brokerage for a long time. If you have some agent that comes into the office and they want coach, oh, I had a horrible day. And you have to tell them because you're their coach, but you're also their broker, something that they don't want to hear, that they're going to have as a confronting thing. They will quit your brokerage. So that's the reason, you know, Inman talks about this sometimes. Brad asks the question, why are brokers doing better training? Well, I just told you, because the agents will quit. They'll leave. You cannot uh, have a relationship with an agent, brokers, office managers, Brad, if uh, as a coach and as a broker, because the nature of that relationship, those two things are different. The agent will just quit. They'll be offended. If there's a such, if, for example, I've made this mistake personally, more than once, unfortunately, I'll be in a situation where, you know, I'll see that I have the opportunity uh, from my coaching experience to help somebody. And maybe it's non-agent, maybe it's just somebody, doesn't matter where. 
And then I'll start coaching them. And then it's like, I'll be like in this conversation with them. And I'll realize I'm being a dumbass because a, they didn't, even if they asked for it, it, they weren't ready for it. They didn't, they, that nature of that relationship is not ready for someone to be just essentially jumping in like a superhero being, you know, super coach doesn't work like that. So you have to, as an individual say, I want to be coached. I want to be very critical of the person I hired to be my coach. I want someone who's really been there, done that. Oh, and don't just go by what they say, make them prove it to you. And then you need to really make sure that you're not just spending your whole time trying to manipulate the coach like you do a lot of other people in your life, let's be honest, and to trying to befriend them. Your job is not to sell them on liking you. Your job is to shut up and listen to what they're saying, assuming they have something worth listening to, just being honest here, and then take the direction. You've got to make sure that coach knows that to do more than one thing. Otherwise, you're going to be a one spoke a wonder and you're going to level off. Okay, so there it is. I mean, I think you guys aren't surprised by us being as direct about this as, as we are. Now, here, here's the irony. Here's the flip side. Julie and I would personally make shit tons more money if we acted like everybody else. We would. It's easier to sell you guys into coaching if it's mindset coaching, if we're just trying to manipulate you through your emotions. We'll make way more money if we were to start taking money from Bank of America, from Zillow, from all these sponsors, if we were to start allowing them basically to start controlling our message. But we never will even at our own financial detriment. Why? Because in our opinion, it's out of integrity. How can I actually tell you the truth about buying buyer leads if I'm receiving a check from one of the biggest buying lead selling companies in the world? I can't. I'm in conflict. Who's my actual customer? It's not you. It's going to be the person writing me the big check to do my events. You guys get it? That's the reason that Julie and I are kind of the lone voice out there. Oh, there's other people that are telling the truth too. Pat Hyben's a good one. There's other people as well. But most people that are in our space, guys, they're basically just, they have agendas. You know, for all the reasons that we stated, all I ask you to do is take seriously the fact that, you know what, you only live once and you're dead a real long time and you need to not waste any time and don't putz around spending, you know, any more seconds than possible than necessary trying to decide what direction you need to go with your business. You need to suck it up, buttercup, nice Texas saying I learned when we moved here, and you need to really embrace the fact that long-term ever-increasing levels of success aren't just possible, but they absolutely are necessary in your life if you are willing to actually do what you don't want to do and you don't want to do it at the highest level. And remember, the highest and truest purpose of all of us on this planet is being of service to other people. That's what we're trying to do every day on the show. That's what we try to do when you guys request a free coaching call at freecoachingcallsforagents.com. That's what we try to do in our premier coaching program. Our primary aim is being of service to you guys and helping you, the individual practitioner, build profitable real estate businesses, so profitable real estate businesses. So with that profit, you can reinvest and you guys can become rich, rich where your money works for you. You no longer work for your money. Isn't that what you really wanted? Isn't that the reason you got into real estate in the first place? Listen, guys, we love the emails. We read them. We respond to them sometimes on the podcast, like the past couple of days. If you need us for anything, send me an email or Julie an email. It's Tim at Tim and Julie Harris.com or Julie at Tim and Julie Harris.com. God bless all of you guys. Have a fantastic weekend. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris.